That Great Business Show. Winner, Highly Commended Award. Irish Podcast Awards. Welcome to episode 200 of That Great Business Show. Yes, our double century edition of the only business podcast packed with tips, insights, and opportunities on every episode. We are the perfect length for your 5K walk, or you can also hear us on board Air Linkus Long Hall, where we are their proud podcast partners. I'm Conal O'Mora and Fogtestiach. If your business is having legal issues that might prove expensive, make sure to listen back to our colleague from the Fifth Court podcast, Barrister Peter Leonard, on how to save tons of legal fees by heading down the mediation path rather than facing off down at the four courts or the four gold mines, as they are sometimes known. Peter joined us on episode 199, explaining the mediation process and how you can save a fat fortune. Now, on episode 197, we told you how to invest in dinosaurs. On this episode, we've done it again. We found something really curious and interesting to invest in. We'll also tell you about €280,000 in cash available for early stage businesses and clusters. They are the future, and they're looking to solve your business problems. Do stay listening. In business, controlling costs is essential. That includes your business fleet's fuel costs. Maxall, a family-owned business since 1920, are big supporters of That Great Business Show. Maxall Fuel Cards offer tailored solutions for transport fleets of all sizes, delivering efficient fuel cost management for your business at over 700 service stations nationwide. The Maxall dedicated fuel card team wants to hear from you at maxall.ie forward slash fuel cards. How often have you thought you wanted to create a better mousetrap so that you could live happily ever after on patent earnings? Of course, the problem is so often somebody has already thought of your big idea. So sorry about that. You have to stay on the treadmill a while longer. However, and you'll only hear this on The Great Business Show, we have found a way where you can still live off patent earnings even, even if you've never had an original product or process idea in your life. Key Patent Innovations is an Irish company set up in 2020. KPI is a global leader in patent licensing with a field of experts that identify and invest in high-value patent-based opportunities. KPI's portfolio includes patents belonging once upon a time to Hewlett-Packard and to BlackBerry. And Angela Quinlan is the boss who joins me now in studio. Angela, you have one hell of a background. (laughs) Discuss. (laughs) <laughs> well, thanks very much for having me on, Connell. I'm very excited to be here. Well, you are a patent attorney. You graduated first in your class in electronic engineering in Trinity. You went on to do a PhD in digital signal, <laughs> signal processing. You went to Japan. You were in Paris. You were in London. And you're very young. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot more you will be doing, I know. What, tell me all about this business. It's a fascinating business. Um, it's a great business. It's a, I find it very exciting. It's right at the heart of technology legal, business, um, strategic negotiations. So what we do is we take patents, as you said, and they could be patents that were developed by companies that were huge fundamental innovators in their time. So for example, BlackBerry. Everybody knows BlackBerry. Everybody has a soft spot in their heart for BlackBerry. Everybody of a certain age. Yes, there is true. a Gen Z listener here who's saying, BlackBerry, do you eat them? Explain exactly what BlackBerry is, was. That is so true. BlackBerry was the probably the first smartphone, but it wasn't called a smartphone back then because we didn't have smartphones. BlackBerry actually was the first wireless remote access device. We didn't think of it as that. We thought of it as an amazing phone that let us type. There was a keyboard on it. We could access files on our desktops while we were away from the office. And if you're an attorney, a journalist or Anybody in a professional occupation getting your first BlackBerry was the moment in your career that you remembered. And they were hugely and highly addictive and they were known as crackberries. Yes, they (laughs) absolutely were. And we still get emails all the time from people saying, when are you bringing back the BlackBerry? We miss it. We want it back. So BlackBerry developed this phone over and they spent billions in research to develop it. And it really was just so fundamental in its time. 
it was the first, as I said, the first wireless connection device. There wasn't even phone capabilities on the early ones. They were actually just Wi-Fi devices for exchanging data, synchronizing data with your first, with your desktop. So you could leave the office and be contactable um, by email. Then they added in the cellular part so you could call people. But what what's really interesting about that is that was a phone, you know, way ahead of its time at the time. But it also laid the foundations for the world we live in today, technology wise. So connected devices, your car and the infotainment system, the connectivity, the fact that the Bluetooth connection, when you put your phone into your car, um, if people are listening to the podcast on earphones, uh, smart speakers, all of that, uh, playing computer games, it all, it was the foundations that built the, the, the world we know today, technology wise. And you and your company now owns this. Yes, well, we own the we own the patents. Patents, yeah. and um, yeah, it's and that's what's so exciting. I mean, we knew any patent portfolio coming from BlackBerry, such a household name, was going to be phenomenal. But as we've dug into it, we have it a year now, just over a year. And as we've dug into it, it's it's really exciting to see how those building blocks where they've ended up today. So as I said, you know, we're looking at computer gaming, we're looking at automotive, um, security. Just the way it's all connected and intertwined today. So go back a step and explain to me the, your business. You are private equity backed, US private equity firm, I think. And what's your business model? How are you making money out of this? That's right. We're private equity backed. And what we do is we buy the portfolio. So we bought the portfolio from BlackBerry. And remind me again, there were three, 33,000. Yes. 30, How in the name of God can you actually assess that? How do you put a price on that? It is. It's... Um, it's huge. 33,000 is a phenomenally big portfolio. It's one of the biggest transactions in the market that people can remember of. So it's not, that's not a usual transaction. People often buy kind of 100 patents. But you didn't sit at home going through patent one to patent no. 100, patent 1,000, patent 33,000. No. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, we would look at the different technology verticals, as we call them, where so some of the areas we knew where to look you know, BlackBerry synonymous with cellular connectivity, wi- wireless connectivity. So we looked in certain areas. We felt, OK, these patents are really strong here. They'll read across these companies. And by knowing BlackBerry's history and their business model, we knew which samples of patents to look at, where to see and what, what sectors of the market would be applicable. And did this come up for international auction or how did we, how was it sold? Yes, it was sold um, through a sales process. People put in bids, uh, first round bids, second round bids. It was a protracted process. How long? And um, we first encountered it in 2020, the end of 2020, and the transaction went through in May of last year, 2023. Oh my good God. That's a lot of time invested. Yes. Um, So (laughs) we weren't sitting at home, as you say, looking through every single patent in the meantime, but there's a lot of different strands and it was a You know, there were other bidders. There was a lot of things going on. um, And we were running our own business at the same time as well with other portfolios. But okay, so the other business is the same business. Sorry, it's the same business, (laughs) but we were running our licensing campaigns on portfolios we already owned at that stage. So, you know, you can't just focus directly on something you'd like to buy. You have to. How do you make money out of this? So, yes. So what we do is we buy the portfolio, buy the patents, and then we take them and license them to people using the technology in the field. But it must be endless. I mean, you've got, to just take the BlackBerry ones, you've got 33,000 possibilities. And yes, you have your verticals, but like a, a clever mind, and you have one of the cleverest, you'll find uses for them anywhere and everywhere. Absolutely. I think with this particular portfolio, the biggest challenge is to be systematic in it. Uh, if you have a small portfolio, you can go through it one by one and say, this is applicable here, this is applicable here. We have to, so the organization, the project management is key here. And we have to really systematically look sector by sector, looking, as I said, and the way we've developed over the year of doing this is by looking at, as I said, the technology verticals and bringing it back to, I like to think of it like the Lego blocks, the individual blocks that build up the portfolio and looking at it in these terms of blocks and then how you can build each new sector using a different combination of blocks. So the gaming industry perhaps is video. Uh, audio, streaming technology, security technology, maybe some payment processing. 
and we have those five blocks, we build that up. That's the gaming sector kind of covered. Then if you look video conferencing, there'll be certain overlaps, but then there might be more notifications or calendar type entries relevant there too. So again, we try and and we sit and brainstorm with the engineers and the attorneys and try and think how we can parse down the various technology sectors into these blocks. And tell the truth, of course you would. Have you ever found one of these fantastic uh, diamonds within here that you didn't know that you'd even bought? Absolutely. Uh, we found we found what we call the remembrance in the attic. There's always a few in a, in a portfolio and we keep finding them in BlackBerry. We found some about NFC payments. So, you know, contactless payment systems. So, so talk me through that. You find out that you have this patent. What do you then do with it? Do you then start writing to everybody who is involved in NFC and start saying, hey, that's our patent. You haven't paid us. What we would do is we, in essence, we will look at who's using this patent in the market. How do you find out? Uh, we have engineers, we have uh, technologists who sit there and that's their job. We will but, look through and understand the technology, think about it, where it might be used. And it could be reading reverse engineering documents. It could actually be buying a device, tearing it down to look at it. But So that's why we hire a lot of engineers. Um, How big is the company? We have 11 people now in this Ireland. doesn't sound like a lot to go through. First of all, that 33,000. But I mean, it's fast. It, it is, is fast. It is vast. Um, we do use outside reverse engineering teams to help. So if one of our in-house engineers wants to conduct a project, they might start it off, send it out to have people do the teardown, then come back and study the results. So that way we can do parallel processing um, and maximise our impact. One of the joys of this podcast is meeting with people in business, doesn't matter what they're making, but who are obviously, you can actually visually see that they're excited by their business. I am talking to a woman who is absolutely, you're absolutely buzzed by this, aren't you? Yes, I love it. I have to say it's been, it's been phenomenal. And I think, again, the BlackBerry portfolio has just brought so many different aspects, the management side of it all. But seeing those remembrance in the attic, seeing those fundamental patents and it's almost like a history tour through the world we live in, the connected world we live in. I suppose the engineer in me is thrilled by that, seeing how, you know, all technology builds on the past and how it's implemented today. So it is, it's great. It's very exciting. Do You have 11 now. I presume you have big plans because your private equity backers will want to see those plans as well. You are an Irish company, but you're not uh, the only company in the space, unfortunately, says yes. you, yes. that you have some competitors and I'm sure they're biting at your heels because everybody wants to catch the best patterns around or your Rembrandts, as you keep saying. Yes, it is. Um, finding, identifying the right portfolios. We always say that, you know, the the things you need to succeed in this business, it's having the right quality patterns from the right place. Um, somebody like BlackBerry, like Hewlett Packard Enterprises, we have the other portfolio from, who are, you know, fundamental leaders in their field, but also having the right team um, to exploit it. And there are other companies around and we would say we have the right team. They're trying to build the right team and trying to get the right patents. I think at the moment it, it's very hard to envisage a better team than the team we have put together over the last while and uh, hard to envisage a better portfolio of patents too. How much does it cost to buy 33,000 patents? Um, it's all public. The, oh, is it? the was, portfolio was, was, <laughs> is usually when we're asked that, we have to be very coy and it's usually highly confidential. But the the size of the Maliki portfolio, the Maliki is our company name for the BlackBerry portfolio, meant it had to go through regulatory approval in Canada and in the US because of the number of Canadian patents involved and it was a Canadian company selling them. So it was all published. We spent 170 million uh, with a 30 million commitment a few years down the road. And, uh, oh boy. and there's a back I had end. No yes. idea. Patents are expensive and uh, we have to maintain them and run operations on top of that. So it is expensive. And um, that, that's only one of your portfolio of patents. Yes. Now that is a big, big portfolio. Oh, it's a huge yeah. portfolio. 170 million. But then you also have to make some money back on that. And I'm sure you have to make it rather rapidly back as well, because again, those who know of PE know that they don't rest on their little tushes uh, waiting yes. for uh, a check in the post. They'll be chasing you. Yeah, absolutely. We see, though, everything we've seen in the last year on the BlackBerry portfolio, and we have started licensing it already. It's just confirmed our beliefs in it. It's a great portfolio. It's kind of a, we always said once in a career portfolio. It's, uh, it is 
it's quite unique. It's quite special. The vast array of technologies. Um, the it's very global. There's you know it's across multiple jurisdictions, which makes it interesting. You're looking at you know a lot of different markets. But yeah, we're seeing a lot of promise in it. And I think the companies we're speaking to, they're responding to that. They know this value. Like when we speak to a company and say, you know, we've just bought 33,000 patents from BlackBerry, they know there's value in it. They know that we're not talking about something somebody came up with in their head, in their garden shed. This is real, you know, technology that was developed over years and there's real value here. And the uh, idea that you're going to uh, try to extract money out of all of this, that in itself must be, you've already said that you chase people, obviously, but there must be a, a, a day out for every lawyer in the world in this, trying to enforce these patents and trying to catch up with people who may not be so keen to give you money. Yeah, well, we try and do as much in-house as possible because but that's, ex- that's yeah. expensive. How many lawyers um, do you have? Um, we have in-house, we have, I'm a patent attorney and we have Three other patent attorneys I have to count because we've but, grown. But that's four. Yeah. Now, I'm just thinking global. Like, you need 4,000. We do have a network of outside counsel that we deal with. But in our day-to-day business, I mean, the ideal for us is to contact a company. We, we only contact companies when we have evidence. So we will show them evidence of their infringement. It has come to our attention type of letter. Sort of, yes, it has come to our attention. More, we would like to bring it to your attention. Yeah. Um, but we will always send them, you know, identify the patents, mm-hmm. the claims in the patents and how their products are using the patented technology. And people will always dispute this, of course, and say, yes. go away. So that means that you must spend a reasonable time in courts or in litigation somewhere. We do. Now, a lot of companies are reasonable. As they say, we contact them. We have a very well diligence case. We show them evidence. We like to think that already we have quite a reputation in the industry for contacting people about real cases. But you were only set up in 2020, isn't it? That's true. Like, uh, how could you get a reputation in a uh, few well, years? Well, we've had, we've had a few big portfolios in that time, but also um, we've been in, working in the industry for longer. So, you know, the reputation, I suppose, goes with us through different companies. Um, but we do, the patents come from a well-known brand uh, all the all our portfolios come from real innovators, and when we contact people, we have a very well diligence case. Some companies will try and hold out. It's an unfortunate. It's you know it's a reality. It's called business. Yes, it's a reality of our industry. In an ideal world, we contact them, and it does happen. Companies can be very pragmatic. They also know they themselves can save money by discussing, negotiating, reaching a sensible conclusion uh, to discussions. We feel that we come and. I, probably everybody feels, but we really do feel we come with practical license proposals. You know, we know the value of our patents. We've looked at them a lot. We've built up a really detailed case when we contact companies. And a lot of companies do realise that when we reach out to them, we discuss them. These guys know their case, uh, that we know what we're talking about. They know that there's value in the patents and they also just want to sort it out and move on with their day to day. And you say that the BlackBerry portfolio or Malachi is you. Yes. That's brilliant. Do you give each one a sort of kind yes, of an Irish and name? Actually, or a... where Malachi comes from is it's the malic acid is what gives BlackBerry its sharp taste. But of course. And uh, <laughs> IE at the end for Ireland. So it's the malic acid and here in I Ireland. Was, was going to be King Malachi or St. Yeah, Malachi. No, or it's somebody. actually closer <laughs> to BlackBerry. So that's it. Um, but yeah, each portfolio has has its own portfolio company. And you say that that is a once in a career opportunity, which means where are you looking for for the next big BlackBerry portfolio? Or are you on a constant troll, or you have are you waving flags at whoever sells? Who actually sells these anyway? There are uh, global patent brokers. Uh, they could be investment bankers that'll bring these big portfolios. There is a whole industry of brokers who sell anything from one patent to. 10, 100, 1,000. It's generally the bigger uh, investment bankers, brokers that would have the big portfolios. Or we would speak directly, again, working in the industry for a certain length of time. You build up your contacts and you can reach out directly to people and say, you know, if you're ever interested in divesting a portfolio, we'd always be interested in speaking to you. Um, Again, I think in our industry, companies who do that, they want to know that they're dealing with it. Their patents are going to somebody who they can trust. So building up your name and your profile is also and how important. how do you do that? 
we try to operate always um, to, you know, the best business principles, um, to be reasonable and professional in all our interactions with people and to show that we can get good return on vest- investment. That's it. That's the bottom line for everybody. But you are based in Dublin, Ireland. And how do you get that word across all over the world? Well, we work closely with some partners in the US. Um, Patent Platform Services, they're a partner of ours in the US. So we work very closely with them. And I've worked through different uh, iterations in my career with some of the the leaders in patent platform services. So we know each other very well over the years. And it is, I think it doesn't really matter where you're based. We're here in Dublin, but I do travel a lot, but it's, everything's done by video conference nowadays anyway, almost everything. Um, We're interacting a lot with people and the decision makers in different companies. Which means that you work across many, many time zones, which means you must work a very long day. I work multiple days in a day. I'll put it that way. I work, uh, you know, an Irish morning and then I try and take a few hours in the evening around four to eight or five to eight. And then I'll work eight to 10, eight to 11 in the evening. Because again. you're talking to New York or San Francisco. Yes. Or, yes. Yeah. And occasionally to Asia and that'll be a middle of the night. Um, Lovely. Yes. Say, when you were younger, because you're still young, is uh, did you ever imagine this is going to be your career? Like no. you started off... First in the class, we'll say it again, in Trinity, in the engineering. But uh, patent attorney, patent attorney, yeah. Uh, no? No, I didn't even know such a job existed. I was a patent... Did you do very well uh, in your leaving cert? I asked people this. I did. Um, did you? Oh, six million points, did you? No, I, I got five something. I, I got everybody the, asks you, how did you drop the other five or yeah, ten? Yeah, I can't. It was, I honestly chose how old I am that I don't remember exactly five what, but it was five something. I was top in my school at the time. Well done. You. Um, and I did way back then think about doing law or engineering. So I kind of found my way back to the middle, but didn't know that existed at the time. It's mad, isn't it? Because now I can see, as I say again, you are utterly buzzed by this. Every business has a, you can, you can read through and you see 5% margin, 12% margin. That's what you actually work off. What is the margin or why, how do you measure margin in the business that you are in? Because one patent out of the 33,000 could be worth zillions to you. It is very difficult. And I think that's always the the difficulty in our business for investors. Um, it's a business that often struggles. Some have gone public. It's difficult because the, the revenues can be quite lumpy and the expenses, the running costs are high. Um, and there's always uncertainty because when legal challenges can happen, there's always uncertainty. We have to, to live with that. And we're very fortunate that our investors understand that. Um, they Are they specialists in this area? No, they're not. But they've they have a great knowledge in this area. And I think that that makes our interactions with them a lot easier there. They do understand our business very well. And for that, because it is quite unique. Um, so we're, we're very lucky with the investors we have in that sense. So when you meet with them and you're trying to give them a uh, forecast for the next year or two, what are you doing? You're putting a finger in the air saying we should hit revenues of X or Y or... I mean, no, we have to be much more precise than that. So what we'll do is we'll look at the portfolio and we'll say, I see this being applicable to this company and it for roughly this amount or this company for roughly this amount, or it might be... And how do you measure that? I mean, say, again, go back to your BlackBerry, there's a gaming company and you think that you might be able to uh, get some money out of them for that. But how do you measure that? Is, it, is that 500 euro dollars or, or $50,000 or $5 million? It depends on their, I mean, we'll look very detailed at the revenue of the companies we're speaking to. God, there's an awful lot of research in this, isn't um, there? There really is. So it's not, a, it's not a quick book by any means. We'll look at their revenues and that's something as an engineer, I've had to, to learn to look at financial statements and then you have to think about, OK, that's their revenue, but what's their impacted revenue? Where are our patents addressing their revenue streams? And that can take quite a bit of digging to pull out exactly where your patents are. And then the other thing is you have to think about how strong is the read? So are my patents reading on this revenue stream? Are they reading on a core aspect of it or are they reading on some incidental kind of feature that could be switched off and nobody'd notice? Or is it one of the features that that company is using as a pivotal marketing point to get customers. And mm. how strong is the read? How strong is the patent? All those aspects come in. What so your leverage is. Exactly. So that's how we can build up. And I think that's very important because that's how we can build up realistic licensing models for when, when I speak to companies on the other side, I'll give them a proposal and I'll walk them through how I got there. So looking at the revenue, impacted revenue, and I'll be able to justify it and say, look, we're hitting this revenue. That's where we have 
and it's never one patent, that's where we have, well, with the BlackBerry portfolio, that's where we have 100 patents, you know, 20 are charted on your products or on that technology. So it's really core to you, to what you're doing, and it's core to where your revenue is coming. And that's where they know there's real value. And you sound so reasonable. Has anybody ever slammed the phone down on you? Um, well, generally, those people just don't accept the first letter. <laughs> they don't bother <laughs> slamming the phone down. <laughs> they just ignore us. And I mean, that is the reality. And we we are in some litigations. And unfortunately, you know, we will continuously be in litigations while... Sure. Because that, it's, That's the nature of the patent, exactly, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, that's not a, a bad sign. Um, litigation isn't the end of the road. It can be a part of the negotiation process. It can get people to the table. It can just focus minds and, you know, move things along because... If, if people do keep ignoring us or don't engage, that's the other, that's the alternative. Buying the portfolio for 170 million, this is the BlackBerry one. The day that that happened, what did you do? I mean, did you believe it? Could you believe it? Did you ever think, go back to your school days, to your leaving cert, that you'd be buying something for 170 million? I know. it's a, It was a bit of a, like a dream sequence in my head because we had to, the nature of the agreement, because it had to go through regulatory approval, we had to agree to agree and then go through regulatory approval. And then once it was fully agreed, the deal became real. So the Over nine, three years. Um, no, this was, we agreed to agree the 16th of March. I think we, we finalized terms. And I remember the date very well because I was flying out to my, visit my sister in Antwerp the morning after St. Patrick's Day. And I was bringing my parents and my children with me. And by 11.30, we had kind of finalised terms and we were due to leave at, I think, four o'clock in the morning. So I remember signing the document, leaving it with the saying, OK, we've agreed here, um, sitting in my base or in my attic uh, in the black dark and thinking, OK, I've got three hours to get packed, get ready and get everybody up and get them to the airport. Having landed the deal of a lifetime. Yes. So it was it was that. I just love thing. that. Um, yeah, it was exciting. It was phenomenal. I think I arrived in Antwerp and I was telling my sister and she's just like, what is Angela talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I see. Once you expect, explain it to her, yeah. she said, whoa, that is yeah. impressive. So a couple of last questions. The future, like you've done the big deal, but there must be another oh, yeah, big deal. No, we've only done a big deal. Yeah, A big deal, but, but there can't be many other huge deals like that. I would hope so. Um, I know we did laugh about saying this once in a career opportunity and that you can only bandy that phrase around so many times in your career. <laughs> There'll be different once in a career opportunities. Uh, BlackBerry was quite unique in its own way, but there will be plenty of others. And I think it's an industry where, you know, tech companies do what they do so well. They innovate, they operate, and they're best focused on that. Licensing is a very niche industry. As I said, there's so much research between legal, technical, uh, financial, that it's, it's much easier for them to realize the investment, the return on their investment by selling it to us. We can optimize the returns that way. They get their money. They can continue to research oh, okay. and to innovate. Do you know what it's just like? It's like um, the musicians who sell their portfolios of songs, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. And it lets them keep going. Yeah. And and that's why I think more and more technology companies and technology companies rely on the value of their IP to get investment in their, you know, that's on their balance sheet. And by realizing that they get cash in and they yeah. get to keep investing. So I think there'll be plenty more big deals and we'll Brilliant. be ready for them. And future, two, three, four, five years, what do you think? More than 11 people for a start. Um, yeah, we we would hope to expand. Um, very excited. We were five people just over a year ago. So, you know, we've more, already, than, yeah. Yeah, we've more than doubled and uh, found a really good team. And it's great because we're really building up expertise now. So now we can take in people and train them in-house. It's not, you know, the first people we took in, I trained directly one-to-one. -one. So now we have a team who can train people. So now, you know, the world is our oyster. What kind of beasts are you looking forward to train? Who would you like in on? Uh, Across of technical people, uh, there's always financial people, financial analysts needed. Um, technical, the, the engineering understanding and then patent attorneys. I uh, think it is a brilliant business to be in. Just sounds so exciting and so new. Absolutely. It is. It is great. It's very exciting. Like every business, there's good days and bad days, but oh, it's but overall... Course. I'm, I always say it, I'm still in the honeymoon period. I started working in licensing in 2014. Um, so 10 years in, I'm still in my honeymoon period. Of and it, definitely. you'll never forget the 16th of March, whichever year it was, 2020, 2020? 23. 2023, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's Absolutely. etched into your uh, yes. consciousness. 
Final question we ask everybody. I hope you got the message. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? I did get the message. <laughs> and when I saw it, I didn't have to think twice. Uh, Katie Mullen, captain of the ladies hockey team, Irish hockey team, uh, would be my heart in a heartbeat. Um, she has been on the podcast. Has she? Amazing. And she is absolutely amazing. There, uh, there are two sports people in particular that I've had on the uh, uh, podcast that just stood out for me. One being Katie and the other being um, Paul Galvin of the G- uh, Kerry Junior team, formerly, obviously. They're something different about those two. And Katie is... Absolutely. Yeah. Her her leadership skills, her yeah. communication skills. Um, and I, it, what struck me too is her resilience, you know, in the face of bitter disappointment, not qualifying for Paris, her grace, her resilience. And uh, as well as that, she just found time, you know, in her spare time to be... Uh, she has a master's in biomedical engineering. She is an MBA. Um, so just phenomenal person. And I was fortunate enough to meet her once. Really lovely, lovely person as well. Susan Spence of Softco, who uh, Softco sponsor both of the uh, two uh, hockey teams. Uh, she brought, brought her in here with a lovely chat. So you can listen back. I to I must her listen back to that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Cool. That was brilliant. Please, Angela, when you come, uh, when you double again, come back in again. I could talk to you about this forever. Because I just, I never knew it existed as a business. And congratulations to you. And I remind people again, it's an Irish business founded by Angela Quinlan. And have you got co-founders or? It was just me in my basement during COVID at the time. (laughs) What a brain. Brilliant. Angela Quinlan of Key Patent Innovations or KPI. Great name as well. Uh, Congratulations on that. And thank you for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thank you so much. It's been lovely. That Great Business Show. Maxol, a family-owned business since 1920, has introduced Maxol HVO Pro, a low-carbon emissions fuel, to their network. This low-carbon emission fuel can play a key role as part of your business's sustainability strategy. Available at selected locations nationwide for fuel card customers, Maxol HVO Pro is 100% renewable biodiesel with up to 90% lower carbon emissions. It's compatible with most new diesel engines and is recommended for fleet vehicles. Visit maxol.ie forward slash HVO Pro for more information. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. That great business show. Winner, highly commended award. Irish Podcast Awards. If your business has either been trading for fewer than two years or trading for more than two years, but isn't profitable yet, stay listening. Because shortly I'll be talking about the Intertrade Ireland Seed Court Fund that gives away substantial cash prizes to eligible businesses, €280,000 in total. Damien McConville is project manager with Intertrade Ireland and Stephen Barry Hannan is also a project manager, but he's with an organisation called Circular Bioeconomy Cluster. They're here to highlight something else Intertrade Ireland is involved in. It's called BioDirect Challenges. And I'll leave the explanations to the two lads here. They're looking for innovators in the packaging, construction, textiles and or agriculture sector. So if that's you, stay listening. But first, it would be remiss of me not to ask about that 280,000 seed corn fund. Damien McConville, tell me all about it. Yes. Well, the seed corn competition is an opportunity for businesses uh, across the island of Ireland who can come together and pitch ideas, uh, business ideas to win a share of that. The key thing, as you've said there, Connell, is that it is cash for the business. It's, and we love cash. Yeah, well, <laughs> because a lot of the competitions give you to the value of and you find out that it's advice and stuff, which is overpriced and stuff like that. But this is cash cash. This this is cash cash. And the key thing about it is, is that it's, it's not just for one winner. There's a whole host of subsections, including regional winners 
and different areas such as sustainability and, and other areas. So it's not just about being the number one business or startup on the island of Ireland. There's numerous opportunities to gain it. But something you did say, yes, cash is one of the main motivators, but it's the process the businesses get to go through. So they follow through equity advice, basically equity advice, fundraising clinics, and it's getting the contacts and connections is what we see time and time again. Because although there's different competitions within the main competition, um, there can only be a small number of winners. But if you know what you're doing and what you're looking for, you can build up your contacts and connections and how to actually go out and attract investment. As you say, the process is part of it is to learn how to pitch and pitch good, mm, as you yes. might say. Yeah. Well, we might actually come back to the fund uh, again, because it's something I've been a huge proponent of over many, many years, because I think it's just a brilliant idea. But let us get into what both of you want to actually talk about here, the BioDirect Challenges, plural. Stephen, Stephen, Barney, Hannon, tell me all about what you're talking about. Um, so the project started there, buddy, I say last year, um, and it was uh, started by Intertrade Ireland's Synergy Programme. So with Intertrade Ireland, it's all about that cross-border collaboration. So my colleague Katrina and the guys at Intertrade and the other partners, Ulster University, Queen's University, uh, ATIM cluster. I that. saw this, uh, This at, is it ATIM or what does that stand That's for? It. So I suppose they are um, advanced manufacturing. They're based out of Toos. So I suppose if you're going back to it, the cluster programs is said it was kind of funded by Intertrade Ireland. So they kind of see... No, sorry, just to come sorry. Enterprise, Enterprise Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. Enterprise <laughs> Ireland, yeah. We do so work closely with Enterprise <laughs> yeah. Ireland, but not to steal thunder. So they're funded by Enterprise Ireland, um, but they look at economic opportunities across across the country. So you have different clusters based on different economics, activity and opportunities. So ours is Circular Bioeconomy. I'll get into what that is in a sec. But um, the other cluster is Advanced Manufacturing, and then you have IDM, which is uh, Digital Manufacturing, and then there's a wood one and a construction one. Um, and basically, it's kind of like a triple helix model. So that's fancy words for funded by funded by Enterprise Ireland. It's attached to a university, so they have kind of like a researchers backing it up as well. So they create projects for those. And then some of the clusters will then be funded by other members, like SMEs and things like that, just to create. So the clusters then they work to to create value for all stakeholders. So they create projects, they help them with marketing, they. All that kind of stuff. And you have now got me completely confused. Give me a couple of examples as to what you are doing. So with, suppose, the, the circular bioeconomy cluster, our area of focus is on circular economy and bioeconomy. So what is the bioeconomy? So the bioeconomy is kind of creating value from natural and renewable resources, resources in a sustainable way. So it's not just extracting and not regenerating. So it's just keeping... I suppose it's kind of balancing finite resources and also biomaterials. So to keep them in regenerative practices and then for finite resources, keeping products and services within the system. So it's to reduce waste and other, create other value. So think about, you know, the right to repair. So instead of just discarding the mobile phone or we, one of our partners, St. Vincent de Paul, that's a circular economy. I saw that actually, that of all yeah. the things I said, Vincent de Paul, then when I looked into it, they're doing something in textile, isn't that right? Yeah, so if, you know when you have clothes that you kind of don't really want to use anymore and you just you bring it back to the to um, St. Vincent de Paul's shops. So that's circular economy. Instead of dis discarding it, you're bringing it to the shops and they distribute it to other people then. So it's keeping it in the system, reducing waste. Yeah, that's what the, the circular economy is. And why is Intertrade Ireland involved in this? Yeah, well, Intertrade Ireland, for anyone who doesn't know, we're the body with responsibility for all island trade and business development opportunities. So I'm going to cut a long story short. In, in around 2015, there was research into looking at how we could support sectoral ecosystems. And this led to one thing, led to another. And we landed with clusters as a vehicle to support not just one business, although we do have fantastic projects such as seed corn, which we've mentioned to support individual businesses. But we started to explore how could we support clusters and networks of businesses that came together. Stephen has mentioned, you know, how a cluster can bring businesses with a similar interest together. So we started looking, how can we use clusters then to help um, almost in their own challenge process? And the first thing that we ask a company uh, or a cluster when they apply for funding is what is the need? Katrina Power um, led up on this project uh, at the start and certainly is heavily involved still. And they had, she identified a need within her cluster in terms of getting access to supply chains and narrowing supply chains and getting innovative bioeconomy and circular economy solutions 
into, let's say, a larger companies and larger businesses. So it's that win-win um, where smaller companies get the chance to work with bigger companies and bigger companies get a more agile and adaptive uh, approach from a small company. Why Intertrade are in- interested um, is bringing together companies and organizations on that cross-border and all-island basis. Really, when you look at it, the closest market for companies um, in Ireland is Northern Ireland and vice versa. If you're in Northern Ireland, your closest market is Ireland. So we're all we're interested in building up those connections um, between companies and companies, companies and researchers, companies and public funders uh, across the whole island of Ireland. And I'm almost tired saying it, but Martin Nocton of Glen Dimplex is the brilliant example of how to start your export business because he started Glen Dimplex, I think, in Dundalk, exporting to Newry, wasn't that it? And yep. out of that, he built a zillion billion dollar business. He's a happy man. Well, it's as if you, you laid the perfect example because Martin Nocton was Intertrade Ireland's first uh, chairman as well. So you could see that that all island trade was very close to Martin's heart. Um, and it really is that it's it's looking at the skill set on either side of the border and building that into your business and how to utilize that instead of being afraid of utilizing it. And going back even further, probably before either of you were born, I was involved with the Compact Ireland Trade Awards. Mm-hmm. And that's where I came across Martin Nocton because he also gave his time, which is extremely valuable, uh, to the to chair those awards because he really, really believes in that. It's a brilliant idea. Fantastic. So mm-hmm. back to clusters. Clusters, I think, Stephen, you uh, sent me uh, a guest for the show a long time ago about yes. clustering. Yeah, It makes so much sense. Discuss all about clustering, the brilliant idea of clustering. Yeah, I suppose I can just go into the some of the the organisations we've helped. You know, we're really set up to to really help the SMEs. So the idea is, you know, we everybody has businesses, researchers, all this. They have a very individual need and a very individual expertise. Someone might come to us and say, "I just need a bit more work on creating more value out of a product." So Donegal Yarns approached us, and they were they had a um, textile waste, and they wanted to look for ways to actually use. The, the, the textile waste in the air and can they bring it back into their system and use that for their line so that was something we did with them we also did kind of um, a thing called closing the loop so we actually so we got some of our members like um, MyGog and we put them in front of uh, MyGog we've had MyGog on uh, the yeah, program so yeah. Member of yeah. Us. Yeah. yeah so we had them on and they we put a few of our members in front of um, uh, investors. So the investors were SVG Ventures and also the European Circular Bioeconomy Fund. So we kind of coached them on a little bit of pitching and stuff like that. So a few of them got through and so they've been doing very, very well. And then I suppose another one would have been Wasp as well. We're now doing looking at 3D printing. So for us, it's all about use. Instead of trying to remove plastics, petroleum-based plastics out of the system, is there a way of using um, kind of locally sourced um, biomaterials in the 3D printing process? So as you can see, it's quite varied. Another one we did was we put a consortium of people together, loads of universities and loads of PhDs together to um, call Circ City Bio Waste. And that's very, very great, fancy. Great, but great, Very, very big titles. <laughs> but what it is, it's really just an investigation of all of the waste that comes out of an urban environment. And can we create value out of it? Yeah, for do energy. Some, do clothing, something with it, like. exactly. Yeah, yeah sounds so like a good idea. Yeah. Who pays for all of this? In other words, if I'm an SME, the first thing I'm going to say is I'd love brain power, or uh, but I can't afford it. For us? Um, well, to pay for it, as I said, it's Enterprise Ireland with us. And then some clusters charge for their members, and rightly so, but we don't at the moment. And then we also get paid by... by now, while stocks last. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We're not going to say, we're not going to say, yeah, but we, so some of, the, some of the clusters get funded by the members. Obviously, Enterprise Ireland continue to fund us, but also we look for EU funding projects, projects like Intertrade Ireland as well with BioDirect and then some national projects as well. And for what you're doing at the moment, this one uh, that we're talking about, packaging... Construction, textiles, agriculture. Talk to me about any agriculture uh, project that you might have seen or heard of, because obviously there's a lot of agriculture and a lot of people in agriculture looking, trying to make a living now. Yeah, so um, we are kind of with like another part. So we're attached so with MTU and then there's us, but we're attached to Cirque uh, Bio. Right? Now, uh, MTU is Munster Technological That's it, yeah. University. That's it. And there, there is a research group in there called the Cirque Bio Research Group. So there's a team of people. There's 25 of us there. And a lot of them are looking at creating extra value for agriculture. So one of the projects actually that just came out there recently, you can see, you know, it's an 8.7 million fund for 
um, Carberry Group, one of our members as well, which is creating um, extra value and products out of grassland. So it's a, there's research going to, and uh, biorefinery um, funding to, uh, it's going to be some European partners as well. But, but using, Carberry is not an SME. Carberry is a decent sized company. Yeah, that's true. That's, so that's if I'm an SME in agriculture, yeah, how do I start? Where, where do I start? What do I do? To get involved with us, um, it's very simple. You just have to go onto the Circular Bioeconomy Cluster website. Would you not call it something simple? <laughs> go. You see, go <laughs> is a brilliant name because everybody remembers go. Yeah, no, that wasn't my choice now, but we had to. <laughs> they all, all the clusters are called by what they what do. what they do. Yeah. yeah. So um, if you want to get involved, it's open to any SMEs. We're growing still. Um, we have sixty-seven members across all types of industry from hotels to, to agriculture to hospita- you know, other hospitality, stuff like that. But if you want to become a member, you just have to go onto the website and go to the membership. You download the form. It's not that hard. It's just a little bit of detail. And you tell us on the form what kind of services you need from, from us. And that's it. We'll do a follow-up call and see if we can help you out. You know, I know it sounds a bit daft, but do people know what they actually want? You know, you feel <sighs> that there's something you could do bigger, better, brighter but that you might need is the very brains we're talking about, that yeah. they may have insights that mm, be able to, might be adv- advising you. Mentoring, we love mentors. They might mentor you to say, have you ever thought of this? Yeah, and that's kind of what we do as well. So we, oh. we, we, uh, so okay, we, well, that's good. <laughs> we deal with what they've told us that they want help with. Yeah. And then we, because we have them, we have a whole connection with the European cluster as well. There's hundreds of them. Um, and then there's probably thousands of them across the globe. And those of our connections with up north, south. So we kind of match make ideas. So to kind of help them what they want, we'll also, we will pick up the phone and say, I have this idea. Is this, do you think this might be of value to you? And they'll say yes or no. Well, that's it. You know? But it, it, you are right, Connell. It's, it's getting SMEs involved in organizations such as clusters. Uh, the reason that Intertrade Ireland have gone down, yes, the, the whole support in the sector, but cluster managers are the people that are out talking to businesses day to day. To get a, a, an SME owner's time for him or her to to hold those conversations with organisations like Intertrade Ireland, Enterprise Ireland, if you're from Northern Ireland, and Best NI, it, it takes a lot of time. There's a lot of funding agencies out there. So what we find one of the benefits of cluster managers is they, they pull out the pertinent information and they're able to go to the members and they can advise them. You're, you're ripe for going to Intertrade Ireland. They have connections on all island bases or actually go to your local Leo for this. So they do help pull out what the business needs and the steps involved and in how, how to get there. And if I'm in Belfast, there's nothing to stop me doing business with um, a Monster Technological University or anything else. It's a, it is what it is. It's well, all island. It, it, it is, but what, what we have found, and we, we have research to back this up, is that if you're in Belfast, you're less likely... We're picking on, on Cork, although they're in good mood today after <laughs> yesterday's hurling. But um, you are less likely to to um, to do business um, either with the likes of Munster Technological University or else another business in Cork. So what the clusters and what Intertrade Ireland's role in this is to actually introduce them. And we, you were talking to Stephen about the role of a cluster. One of the key roles of a cluster is the networking and, and matchmaking piece. And what Intertrade Ireland, why we're interested is literally bringing businesses together from Belfast and an area in Ireland or all Ireland coming together, getting them in the same room, sometimes virtually, but where possible face to face. And then the conversations happen because business people want to do business and you basically introduce them and they take over. And those meetings, are they held frequently or? <laughs> well, this is why we use the Lexus Stevens project um, as part of our process. There's actual Stephen can fill in yeah, the details, we'll but there was actual workshops where people came together physically. And at times it's structured. It's not, you know, I'm the one who said, just put them in a room and let them do business. But there's a structure to it um, and it follows, you know, a, a flexible agenda, I think it's fair to say. What's my appetite? What's the success rate or how do you measure success? It's, um, I suppose there's kind of loads. But this was, it's just keeping the business successful. We we kind of ask them how, the, how they're doing. We measure... Did we get them involved with projects? Did they, you know, if it's marketing, it's obviously their marketing metrics. Did they get funding? Were they put through to the right people? Did they, if a company wanted to be on top, you know, in front of stage to actually be talking about this? So it's all about the individual needs of the companies. So it's a whole host of KPIs. It could be new projects. It could be 
It could be new value streams. Mm. Um, I suppose for us as a circular bioeconomy cluster, it's, you know, uh, the overall thing is to keep reducing waste and bringing people together. Which is a good yeah. thing. And what about your, when I go back to your successes, have you, uh, either of you, any success champions that you love talking about? Well, absolutely. Yeah. Now, all my experience is actually working with clusters, but some of our um, successful projects would be with Cyber Ireland, who we connected with Northern Ireland Cyber or NI Cyber. And what they actually done was they took cybersecurity companies from North and so I, I keep as a default going to say Belfast, but it's the whole of Northern Ireland. Of course, I just and, said, yeah. And equally yeah. the, the whole of the um, of Ireland as well. But taking cybersecurity companies, they then led on a piece of research looking at the cybersecurity needs for advanced manufacturing. And interestingly, we all know about our desktop. The, the research basically found that our desktops, our, our, works, our workstation computers, they're fine, but it's the connection down on the factory floor is where you could your business could be compromised. They took 20 advanced manufacturing companies and actually partnered them with cybersecurity solution providers. So as a direct result of that, you had 20 companies with enhanced cybersecurity readiness. Um, and then the research is also follows on, so other companies can avail of it and others. If you're a cybersecurity company and you now understand what the needs of advanced manufacturing companies are, then you can tailor your products to fit that. Everybody in business wants everything done yesterday. How quick is the process, either of you, is that I'm sitting there, I'm in agriculture, I'm an SME, and I need a solution yesterday. How The process, I know I go online, have a, fill out the form, etc., how quickly well, do you can, get traction? Can I jump in? Because Please, Stephen yeah. may have a practical example, but back to the benefit of a cluster and a, and a cluster manager, you are shortening whatever the length is, you're shortening it down if you know who to go to. <clears throat> if you know the person to go to in the first instance to put you in contact with the right person, because whenever you're going through, and there's plenty of supports out there and into Trade Ireland have some fantastic supports, but if you can narrow down your focus, then any timeline you have after that will be shortened as a natural consequence. Makes sense. Stephen, do, is, have you got... Yeah, so I suppose uh, it was 2020, late 2022, 2023, um, the, the the kind of the wool industry came to us and they were kind of asking, we need to create more value out of the, out of wool. So um, our colleague Katrina Power kind of did an investigation on it and she was kind of did a value chain analysis and a process map. So she managed to get all of the... So a load of stakeholders together to really look at um, creating extra value um, for for wool. And she ended up doing um, a department, so a DAFM report on it. And straight then after that, it was like a proper investigation. You can see it on our website, actually. You can see if you go to the, it's called the, 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 the Wool Council or the Wool Hub. So you can see then at the bottom the process map. And it's all about creating extra kind of products and value opportunities out of that. And we'd actually see it in bio, this BioDirect project now that actually wool might be useful for pharmaceutical packaging. It might be useful oh, for okay. insulation uh, in the construction industry. And you know, so I've heard, I can understand the insulation one. I've seen that, that obviously. Yeah. But uh, packaging, there's a, a clever idea. Yeah. If you could, uh, because wool, from what I understand, is very, very, very low uh, value. Am I right? Yeah, I that was it, that was the issue. That was yeah. it. it. Was just it was just kind of the the, with the textile stuff. So now it's just about creating more value from them. Is in can we get more value out of waste as well? So that means that the companies will be able to say we're using, you know, reusable material that creates more value, more buy in for people who are buying their clothes in an eco conscious way. And then, as I said, we're with BioDirect. We're finding now that there's 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 uh, construction applications. And, things like that. and yeah. you know, the the sort of it wouldn't be like me to be down here without a selfless plug of Interfaith <laughs> Ireland. But what what we are hoping for is that if, if there is an idea, for example, if it's insulation or packaging for um, pharmaceuticals or, or anything else, then there's a follow on. You know, to re, to engage with Interfaith Ireland, and you can use some of our innovation supports to actually go and get the product, build the product or, or develop the product. So it can be an innovation boost or a B2B. And again, some of the people um, involved in them teams from Intertrade Ireland are sitting on the scoring panel, so they will be able to identify is there a fit for Intertrade Ireland. But crucially, if not, where's the other support, where's the other agency support to come in and, and assist it? Just on packaging, we had a long time ago now, Tony Smurfett of the Smurfett, uh, he's no longer Smurfett Capital, they've just, uh, Smurfett Westrock, I think now. Uh, it's now the largest packaging country, company in the world, I think, mm -hmm. or damn near. And he is very keen 
to do anything he can to be sustainable. And they're making very, very interesting uh, new types of packaging. So mm-hmm. he might join your cluster. He might, he might. Uh, so is there a timeline? Is there a deadline or any other line that you can think of that uh, people should be aware of? Or is it just go three, six, five days a year? We just, uh, whenever you've got an idea, you pick up the phone to your cluster meister. Mm. I'm giving them a new, giving them a new name. No, no, they have enough names. Don't be given any more now. <laughs> So what what's the timeline? Well, there's, there's two answers, Stephen. You know, and Stephen can answer on on this project. But yeah, yeah absolutely, I I would encourage any business on the island of Ireland to be a member of a cluster and to speak to them. You know, it, it does no harm. They're they're not going to come chasing you if you decide, look, this isn't for me. But just investigate what are the benefits of being a member of a cluster. You were asking Stephen about KPIs. You know, for Intertrade Ireland, the the single we we do have lots of KPIs, but the single most important one with clusters is connections. And if you can build connections across the border, if you're not looking to see who in the, who is in the opposite jurisdiction, how are you going to know that they exist? So engage with a cluster. There's loads of projects going on. Of course, we're talking about the bioeconomy project. There's loads of other projects going on and, and come and talk and to simple us. simple maths. There is a third more of the uh, of the population up there uh, to sell to or similarly three times the mm. the. Uh, uh, market down here for people up in Northern uh, Ireland. Absolutely, yeah. and and something a, a key sort of message that I would like to get across um, as well is that we are using our synergy program to encourage people to collaborate, businesses to collaborate. But we have we are living the lessons that 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 we are teaching other people. Where we're collaborating with Enterprise Ireland, we're collaborating with Invest Northern Ireland, um, and we've been successful with receiving shared island cluster funding as well. So. The supports coming from the three agencies are only going to increase. So we're hoping that we can see bigger, you know, I don't mean better projects, but in the in the phrase that we use, bigger, better projects, such as the the bioeconomy projects. At this was look at the core of the clusters is collaboration. That's what it's here to yes. to set up and create opportunities for all the stakeholders and even ones that aren't outside of our members. This is people we know that we can bring in, and the idea is just to is to help them. At SMEs, you know, they have. Some have limited resources and the biggest constraint they'd have is time. So it's a case of you let us know what we want. We'll go away. We'll come back and see. Here's some opportunities we have. And that kind of leads us on to the, the, the BioDirect project, which is a collaboration. Well, a long, long project. time ago, I used to be on radio and I, with a business program. And I had a guy on from Northern Ireland whose name I've forgotten, but I'll never forget his business because he was able, what he was, his uncle maybe and his dad were huge in um, meat uh, um cutting up meat and et cetera. And he saw all the waste and he made an absolute fortune out of bits of the animals that were going into waste. And one of them was, and he had to change the name because uh, he couldn't send emails with it. It was Bull's Penis. Was He was making money out of it and it was called a pizzle. So if you look up pizzle on your Google, it is a Middle Ages term and it is correct English and he was making money out of that, out of like every part of the animal. Mm-hmm. And there was a, right across those chickens and uh, lambs and everything. And he was making money out of it and a lot of money. He was Fantastic. magnificent. Uh, I'd love to have him back on again. Now, you and both of you, at least both of you do know the final question that I do ask, but one of you forgot about it, but we'll get on. Sorry, Stephen. There was one other thing that you want to mention. Yeah, so I suppose get really into detail for the BioDirect actual opportunity there. So we had the four roundtables and we had people... Uh, Where were they? Sorry? Where were they? So we had two in Port Leash, we had one in Athlone and then we had one in Belfast. So we invited people across the whole value chain. We invited SMEs, large businesses, um, c- uh, clusters, funding, funding opportunity people and... Just and, and department as well, the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, they came involved as well. So we invited everybody to come along. And they all we, turned up? Yeah, we had a huge, we did a much, we had a really big buy in. So everybody was really, really, really wanted to collaborate. It was really nice as well, even though we had the separate workshops, all of the workshops were talking about all of the other sectors. So there's a huge opportunity we found as well now that actually uh, there's nobody, none of the sectors are very separate from each other. And we realize now that them working together will actually create more circular bioeconomy opportunities. So they all want to talk to each other. So in Belfast on the 4th of September and the Crown Plaza, we're bringing all of the four sectors together so they can be creating, again, that collaborative piece, creating the opportunities. But the, bio, the next stage of the BioDirect project is there's 
there's an open submission call. So at the workshops, all of these companies and organizations were talking about their challenges and their sustain of their approach to sustainability. And they're asking for help across the whole country now. So it's open to SMEs, it's open to researchers, it's open to startups, it's open to solution providers, anybody who wants to if have a go. If you are it. interested, basically. If you are yeah. interested. And there are 10... There are 10 solutions, which I'll go through v- quite briefly. So you'll do Best not because just drive people to your website, because otherwise okay. you'll be here all day. So what's, what's the, the website? website? So it's um, the Circular Bioeconomy Cluster website, so cbcsw.ie, or just simply go Say that again. cbcsw.ie, or simply go to, um, simply type into Circular Bioeconomy Cluster into Google. You'll see us pop up the top, go over to your BioDirect, and you'll see all of the challenges there. So we've the likes of Kingspan, Ulster Farmers Union, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, ATIM Cluster, Don Meats, um, and all these people who want... He, he wasn't going to read them out, but he's going to so read them out. I didn't read the exact <laughs> challenges, but they, they're all looking for people to help them in yeah. their business. So um, it's a case... I went onto the website. It is absolutely clear yeah. what people are looking for. It's great. The Brilliant. forms as well. If you're thinking as well, this is going to be a big, it's a big undertaking for to actually submit an idea. It's not this. The form is very, very accessible. It's, it would take you at most an afternoon to get an idea there and your ideas will be put in front of these these organizations and obviously our shared resources as well too. So the idea is that we'll be creating projects, direct route to market ideas. You'll have a huge, like the Ulster Farmers Union Kings, but these are major groups. So they'll be looking at your idea to show their networks and get it involved in their it's company. Lovely idea, lovely yeah. idea. Mm. Final question, Stephen, hire in a heartbeat, who would you? I was thinking long and hard about this, but I'd say Jane Goodall, the, the researcher, she was, you know, about uh, primates. One, she's a very effective communicator, she's passionate. And she's she kind of brings people along and is a great educator as well. Cool. And Damien? Yeah, sadly, I'm not like Stephen. I wasn't thinking very long and hard about it. But, <laughs> but per, it's also very honest. Or <laughs> perhaps, yeah. No, I am slightly biased because um, I'm not sure when the podcast goes out. But for context, I was at the Limerick and Cork hurling yesterday. So for me, the answer um, has to be Pat Ryan. On the basis that, you know, uh, anyone who can take 82,000 people into Croke Park, and I've just mentioned connections numerous times there, and it's it's all about connections. So to, if you can fill a stadium, you can come and work for Intertrade Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> some some performance. Oh, fantastic. Exactly. fantastic. Fantastic performance. That is, that that was the voice of Damien McConville of Intertrade Ireland. And prior to that was Stephen Barry Hannan of the... Circular Bioeconomy Cluster. Oh, come on. Give us a break. Let's get a proper name. <laughs> well, actually, this is announcement. We were Circular Bioeconomy Cluster Southwest. This is the first announcement we've gotten. We we were national anyway, but now this is the, you're, you're the first to hear it here is that we've gotten fully national in name. Yeah. I'll cut it down even more. Just cluster, clustering, cluster something. Good. Thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. It's all go like Chrissy Gno on that great business show.com. That great business show. And that is it for episode 200 of That Great Business Show. Great business insights and inspiration as always. Maxall, a family owned business for over 100 years, advertised with us so that you can get these best tips and insights for your business. So return them the favor and sign up for their fuel card. It is simply great for your business. And sign up for your personal copy of the podcast at thatgreatbusinessshow.com. Share us, like us, and give us five-star reviews. It all helps. Today's sound man or driver of sound is Luke Delaney. Later, studio manager Peter Rice and post-production engineer Neil Horner will put the boom, boom, vava voom into the show to ensure we remain the world's best-sounding business podcast. So from me, Conal O'Moran, to you all, August Slan Tomlin.